thanks a lot for having me. Les asked me to go ahead and give you a quick thumbnail biography, so I'll do that very quickly. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. By the time I was five years old, my parents say they knew I was going to be some sort of a biologist. Uh, our family used to go camping every single summer to the same national park, not Yosemite because my father hated crowds, so I really did grow up in uh, Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. My childhood heroes were Jacques Cousteau and Lloyd Bridges of Sea Hunt, so I was a certified diver by age 13 and went on to undergraduate at UC Berkeley. My, by the end of my undergraduate, I figured out, oh, it's actually marine ecology that I really want to do. So I did my dissertation work at Florida State University studying the ecology of soft corals and compound ascidians. I did postdoctoral work at Colorado State on cockroach behavior. That's for another day. And also taught for a while at Harvard. My first faculty job was at the University of Oklahoma in Norman starting in 88. And since 1992, I have been at the University of Vermont. And I'm going to use this talk today to talk to you about this issue of forecasting nature, how we actually make predictions in science about what is going to happen in future environments. And unlike much of the forecasting work that's been done in environmental science, I'm going to emphasize the role of experiments in ecology, which is a subdiscipline that doesn't use it as much as you might think. OK, so I'm going to first talk very briefly about the drivers of ecological change that are facing the planet right now. And then we'll jump into two studies. I'm going to describe one on global warming. We're going to use forest ants as a model system for understanding the effects of climate change. And then we'll turn to the problem of water pollution. And I will use carnivorous plants as a model system for understanding uh, pollution and responses to it. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we do ecology. Now, by the end of the first two parts, you may think it's self-evident, but there are a few other reasons that I want to talk about that are related to my research path. And then finally, we'll come to maybe a bigger question relevant for you. Why get a degree in the sciences? What's waiting for you at the end of this process if you do go ahead and finish up with a science degree? So let's start with the drivers of ecological change. There are many of them. They are complex. But really, it all comes down to one graph, and that's this. The x-axis is time. The y-axis is the global human population size. And you can see this tremendous spike and increase in numbers as we come into the last 100, 200 years. We're estimated right now to top out somewhere between 8 and 12 billion people over the next 50 to 100 years. That explosive population growth has a number of direct and indirect effects on the environment, uh, one of which is the increase through the burning of fossil fuels and also just the burning of wood of atmospheric carbon dioxide, which has been going up steadily since this graph was first developed uh, in the 1960s by Keeling. And along with that increase in CO2 is a steady, unprecedented increase in global temperatures. So that's showing the deviation from long-term averages over the past few years. And the carbon dioxide graph now is even outdated because we're up now over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. We should have been at about 280 before the start of the Industrial Revolution. The increase in temperature is not constant across the planet. So some places, especially high latitudes, are going to experience and are experiencing more changes than other locations. Second, I'm going to talk about the nitrogen cycle a little bit, or rather about the role of nitrogen in the ecology of terrestrial communities. Most nitrogen is in an atmospheric form where it's inert, but it does pass through a nitrogen cycle. And some forms of nitrogen are biologically reactive. They are taken up by plants and used. And the problem for us starts around, well, it starts at the turn of the century with the burning of fossil fuels which are releasing nitrous oxides, and especially after World War II, the development of synthetic fertilizers. So that's led to a huge increase in this anthropogenic nitrogen, that is nitrogen from our sources, 
Unlike atmospheric nitrogen, this nitrogen is biologically reactive. It can be taken up immediately by plants and microbes, and so it has lots of secondary effects. Some ecologists, including myself, think this may actually be more of a threat than ongoing climate change. We'll talk a little bit more about that. As with global temperature changes, the intensity of atmospheric deposition changes from one place to the next. And uh, we're actually in a part of the world where we have, in, especially in past years, seen pretty high atmospheric deposition of these different sources of nitrogen. All right, let's look first at the global warming problem. We're going to use forest ants as a model system. Just as in medical research, we look for model systems that we can work on where we can get responses in a short period of time. We can't wait long periods, and many of these environmental processes are playing out over decades. We want to get our uh, answers a little bit faster, so forest ants are a great system for looking at temperature change. And the idea of global climate change is something that is actually quite intuitive for all of us because we know how bad we feel if it gets too hot. We know how bad we feel if it gets too cold. We can recognize that if those temperature extremes continue, we're not going to be able to last very long. So we understand this idea that there is an intermediate temperature that for us represents a physiological optimum. Organisms have these different temperatures, but obviously if the temperature starts changing, we're going to move away from that. So a lot of research has looked at just this problem of how the temperature trace is going to have a direct effect really on the physiology of organisms and how they respond to their environment. However, organisms and populations do not live in isolation. They interact with one another. So a lot of the research in ecology now is concerned with this problem. Um, there can be cascading effects where the temperature might directly affect one species, such as a predator or a prey, and then we're going to see indirect effects that are affecting another one. So teasing apart these direct effects of temperature from the indirect effects of other species can be a bit of a challenge. We're going to use ants as our model organism. We can get good time responses. They are exquisitely sensitive to temperatures, and they are the queens of the terrestrial world. They are responsible for most soil formation, not earthworms, and breakdown of prey. So they're very important for ecosystem function in all terrestrial communities. OK, and we're going to do this work in eastern deciduous forest. This is a habitat covering a large area, so we can carry out our experiments in a number of different places. Ants carry out a number of other more specialized functions. So here in northeastern woodlands, for example, they are seed dispersers of trillium, bloodroot, and other understory herbs. Many of these seeds produce a structure called an eliosome. This is a fatty tissue that the ants like to eat, so they'll pick the whole thing up, move it, pull off the eliosome to eat, and that's what disperses the seed. So I'm going to describe to you the results of what we call the warm ants experiment. This was an ongoing experiment for five consecutive years. We heated up patches of the forest floor in two locations, at Duke Forest and at Harvard Forest. This is a good system to look at because we're starting to get near the boundaries of this eastern deciduous forest habitat. There are lots of ant species, some of which are shared between the two sites. And so we set up replicate experiments in each of these places. And what we built were these open top chambers that are surrounded. It's a wood frame surrounded by plexiglass. It is open at the top, so dispersing ant queens can fly in. Can't quite see it, but it is actually open at the bottom. There's a couple centimeters here at the bottom. So ants and other invertebrates can freely move in and out of this structure. OK. And although we are taking lots of measurements inside these chambers, or we were, we don't want to be in there any more than we need to because we don't want to compact the soil and add other effects. So we have these little windows built in around the side that allow us to reach in and carry out our manipulations. So the chambers are set up at these different locations. And to actually heat up this patch of ground, 
is an expensive and complicated proposition. So unlike most classic experiments, we actually don't have true replication here. Each chamber is kept at a different temperature. And really, we had to do that because of the enormous expense of building these chambers and getting them to run. So what do we have? Well, we have nine heated chambers in which we have pushed the ambient temperature up to a maximum of about five degrees above uh, background. That is well within the climate forecast scenarios for the next 100 years. Some of them are even more extreme than this. We also have three unheated control chambers. These have all the electricity and everything hooked up, but they're not turned on. And that's important. That's the equivalent in a medical study of a placebo or a sugar pill because we want to make sure that what we're measuring is actually the responses to the temperature, not the responses to us building these structures and altering the environment that the ants are in. And finally, we have three untouched control plots where we don't have any of this apparatus set up, but we do keep track of the ambient temperatures. Now, how do we heat these things? Well, we have a plastic velum, a hollow set of plastic piping that runs through. We have a heating chamber outside where hot air passes over a heat panel. And this warm, moist air passes through this tubing. It's really like the radiators on some old houses that are heated by water. And this effectively raises the temperature in the chambers. So these are infrared photos you can see in the right, that's the most highly heated chamber compared to the control. These chambers run continuously all year. They're hooked up to a computer monitor in order to maintain the temperatures that we want. The most heated ones will uh, melt out a couple weeks earlier, week or two earlier than the controls, and they also stay snow free a little earlier into the season. And of course, we're concerned that we're in the beginning that we're actually um, getting the results that we want. One issue with these kinds of experiments is, are these chambers really big enough to see the effect that we want? Well, remember, we're working with ants. And so what we need to do is kind of scale down to an ant's body size to then look at the chambers. Or better, let's take the chambers and scale them up to human size. So that's what I've done here. This square, which I've put in lower Manhattan, if the chambers were for humans, that's the size of one of our chambers that we would have from an ant's perspective. And in terms of the layout of the entire design, that would be roughly the size of Manhattan Island with these little things scattered around. Of course, that's not simply an analogy. When we build cities and replace vegetation and biomass with concrete, we actually do create literal heat islands. But this gives you an idea that we actually, from an ant's perspective, have a fairly large manipulation that we are applying. OK, so this graph is showing through time the, that's delta air temperature. So that is the change in air temperature that has been caused <clears throat> by our heating. And you can see that it is indeed showing the pattern that we want. Perhaps more interesting, though, is to look at the actual temperature profile in these plots. And when we do that, what we see is that the heated ones are the red colors, which are here near the top, <clears throat> and the cooler chambers are down here near the bottom. But what we have done is to preserve the seasonal and daily profile of temperature. Our treatments have simply pushed that a little bit higher than what the background was. So that makes it a very realistic experiment. That's exactly what we would see with real climate change are these sorts of changes taking place. OK, well, we're talking about ants. So that makes you think of an ant nest. You might have a vision in your head something like this. This biologist at uh, Florida State, actually one of my former mentors from my graduate school years, is standing next to a nest of desert ants. It's actually an aluminum cast that he's done. So this sits submerged underground. This giant nesting structure holds 50, 70,000 individual workers. There's a single queen who may live as long as 20 or 30 years commanding this whole structure. So in the desert, these ant nests are fixed. They are a, a feature of the landscape. It's actually visible from global satellites. But in our eastern deciduous forests, 
Our ant nests are much different. Here in this part of the world, ants nest in tiny twigs, they nest in acorns, they nest in little clumps of leaf litter, and they will move around quite a bit. The queen will frequently pick up and move her nest to a different location based on what she's experiencing in that area. And so we wanted to study this process. We didn't just want to turn the chambers on and count the ants. We actually wanted to see the changes that were taking place in this community. So we built these little ant penthouses. So this is a scoured out piece of plywood with a little chamber in it. And we cover that chamber with a plexiglass lid so that we can peek into it and see what's there without actually disturbing it. From the ant's perspective, this is awesome housing, okay? Because this is highly protected. This is exactly the sort of thing that they like to set up camp in. So those go out into the field. We put several of these little nest boxes in each one of those experimental chambers. So we're actually putting this colonization source out in the whole range of temperature manipulations that we've done. And then once a month, we go out, carefully turn these over, and we can identify through that uh, clear opening what the species is. And then we carefully replace it and put it back down in. And that's done continuously over the whole five years of our experiment. OK, uh, the ants frequently replace one another. There are lots of violent encounters that take place. A complex set of players think Game of Thrones when you're thinking about what's going on in these individual ant nest boxes. All right, well, if we think about a single box, there are a couple patterns we can see. First, we can look at just the occupancy who's in that box. We also see events of colonization. So a nest box that's empty one month will come back, and there will be a colony in it the next. And we also see extinctions that can occur, because some of these will temporarily disappear from an individual box. And we can even see replacements. So we have these numbers from Duke Forest and from Harvard Forest. That's the orange and the green. Each of the little initials represents a different ant species, and I'm not too concerned about those details for us right now. The arrows go from this sun, which represents mean annual temperature, and the arrows are showing the effect of temperature on those different processes. So for example, over here, the cooler temperatures um, increase the extinction rate for this particular species. And the only point I want to make from this graph is we do have a few cases like this where there's a simple direct effect of temperature on a species. But more often, we have these little networks that include direct effects, but also include indirect effects of the other species. And this is what I was referring to in the start of the talk. These are the kinds of interactions we're trying to tease apart. So simply heating up the environment has these cascading effects. There are direct effects on particular species. And there are indirect effects that are operating through other species. And so this confirms this idea that these little network structures in responses to temperature may actually be fairly common. Let's go ahead and look at the overall extinction rate uh, because it shows an interesting and somewhat counterintuitive pattern. The x-axis of this graph is showing you the chamber temperature, and the y-axis represents the probability or chance of an extinction taking place in a single month. Each circle here represents a different chamber from the experiment, and the open ones are the controls. And one thing I want you to notice is that these are the cool sites at Harvard Forest, and these are the warmer sites at Duke Forest. The warmest chamber at Harvard Forest, that is the one we heated up the most, is pretty close in temperature to the control treatments further south in Duke. So we have this whole spectrum of temperatures that we've exposed the species to. Now, what do we expect from this experiment ahead of time? What's our initial hypothesis? Well, one idea is that when we heat things up, we know that ants become more active and they move around more. So the simple expectation was that, well, as we heated the system, 
we should see the extinction rate go up because simply it's just more active. We put more heat energy into it. But to our surprise, that is not what happened. Instead, the extinction rate began to go down. What was happening was a couple species that are really like heat were moving in and staying put. So as we heated these chambers up, we actually saw a shift in the kinds of species that were there and a decrease in this extinction rate, which is not what we would have predicted from first principles of physics. Okay, key results uh, from this warm ants experiment. The first is that the experimental warming affects a network of interactions among ant species, direct effects as well as indirect ones that are happening because of this competition that's going on between different species for these nest boxes. And the second key result is the experimental warming leads to a slowing down of the system. And this is quite paradoxical and not what we expected to see. And it's because we have species that are adapted to this warmer climate that like this change. They find these nest boxes. They're also good competitors. They stay in them. And so the overall extinction rate goes down uh, as we see those species replacements. All right. Let us shift gears and consider a second problem that we can attack with experiments. And that is the problem of nutrient enrichment in aquatic ecosystems. And here I'm going to use a different model system, carnivorous plants, which we would not think of as being something we use to study water pollution. But as you'll see in a minute, they are quite useful for that purpose. Um, again, the world population growth has led to this increase in the burning of fossil fuels, which releases nitrous oxides into the atmosphere, and the use of synthetic fertilizers, which releases ammonium and nitrates. All of these forms of nitrogen are biologically reactive. They can immediately be taken up by plants and by microbes. And the sorry state of this aquatic body here is a familiar tale in which aquatic Ecosystems become enriched, especially with phosphorus or nitrogen, which are limiting resources. So we get these huge algal blooms that form. The algal blooms are not able to be controlled by the grazers because there are grazing copepods that feed on algae. So this mass builds up. It eventually starts to shade itself and die off. And as all that dead plant material breaks down, we get a huge oxygen deficit. The oxygen levels fall and we start to lose fish. Dogs get sick when they go in this water. The beach is no longer a nice place to go. So this is a huge universal problem around the world, including on our own shores of Lake Champlain. And we would like to understand how to fix this problem. On the surface, we know what the problem is. We need to get those nutrients out of the water. But as I'll show you, that doesn't always um, solve the problem. So we'll work with carnivorous plants. They are well known through the popular literature. but they actually haven't been used that much for ecological studies. I work on the northern pitcher plant, Saracenia purpurea. This is found in bog habitats, including some within a, just a couple miles of where we are now. The plant is a great subject for studying nutrient deposition. The leaf is not a sexy Venus flytrap. It's just this dull little tube that forms and fills up with rainwater. It does attract insect prey, which fall in and drown and die. The prey are then broken down, nutrients are released, and are taken up by the plant itself. Uh, here in this part of the country, we find these plants growing in ombrotrophic peat bogs. So what you're looking at here is molly bog near Stowe. This little patch of the landscape about 10,000 years ago was scoured out as glaciers retreated from this area. It has essentially no connection with the rest of the water table. So over the past 10,000 years, this has slowly filled up with rainwater and precipitation. It's basically stagnant. And there is a floating mass of peat here. And the plants grow embedded in that peat. That's their habitat. OK, so there it is, surrounded by peat. Uh, that's the open trap. The red coloration and some primitive nectar that the plant secretes helps to attract prey. And we have these downward pointing hairs that make it tough 
for the ants to crawl back out if they should get caught. Now, some carnivorous plants actually create digestive enzymes for breaking down the prey and getting nutrients out. This plant does not. Instead, what it relies on, um, well, a few other things. It uh, lives in these peatlands, has a long lifespan. These plants live 30 to 50 years, putting out new leaves each year. It catches these insects. And as I'll show you, there is another group of invertebrates that actually live in this specialized aquatic habitat. They're called inquilines. So these are the larval stages of some arthropods, uh, flies, midges, and uh, mosquitoes that carry out this part of their life history inside this little self-contained tube. So what we have is a tiny ecosystem contained in each of these leaves. Now, this ecosystem at its base does not actually have a group of photosynthesizing algae. Instead, the base of this food web is captured insects. So ecologists call this a brown food web to distinguish it from a green food web where we would have an algal mass growing. However, this detritus is very similar to what happens in an overloaded open aquatic system when all that plant material dies it turns into detritus, similar to the captured insects. Some of these invertebrates actually shred those prey, and then we get detritus from that. We have a whole group of bacteria and yeast that transform it, and then we have filter-feeding protozoa, mosquitoes, and rotifers that feed on it. Again, it's very tiny, but it contains all of the same elements that we see in much larger food webs. And it's a fantastic experimental system because we can dump the entire ecosystem out into a petri dish. We can add or remove species. We can change the nutrient content of the water. All of these things that are very hard to do in much larger ecosystems. So that's the, the system uh, that we are working with. And we're using it for this part as a model system for studying this process of eutrophication. So, what we do is we bring the plant into the lab and put in an oxygen probe that tells us what the oxygen content of the water is in that leaf. And we can get those readings every 30 seconds. Now, under normal conditions, though that water is clean. It's well oxygenated because, of course, the plant is photosynthesizing, so oxygen is being released. Some of the early naturalists actually talk about breaking off the leaf and drinking this water down, because it really is pretty clean. The plant is not very efficient at catching insects, so you will rarely see very much prey inside the plant. That's under the normal conditions. But experimentally, in the lab, we can go ahead and load up the plant with excess prey. And uh, we can use natural prey from the field. We like to catch uh, paper wasps and freeze them and grind them up. We call it wasp chow but it behaves the same way, and we actually load this plant up with oxygen, with uh, prey. Now, what happens? Well, before the prey is added, we see this nice sine wave, this periodic increase and decrease in oxygen, because, of course, the plant is photosynthesizing during the day, and it's respiring during night. So under normal circumstances, this oxygen level goes up and down. We add the prey, and then we get this collapse. So we go for a state change. Normally we're up around 15 or 20 percent oxygen. After the state change we're down here below 5 percent, almost anoxic conditions. If you squint your eyes, there's still this periodic trace because the plant is still photosynthesizing on its cycle, but the overall oxygen level has dropped. This whole process takes place over just a couple days but it is a realistic mimic of what happens in larger bodies of water over a time course of years to decades. So that's why it's a great system for us to understand what these changes may be and how we might go about preventing them. Okay, so those are the two states. And again, you can see it here in a little bit more detail. It's a gradual change as we increase the concentration of the enrichment we go from that nice sine wave to a strange, irregular pattern. 
and then we get the collapse of the system down to a much lower oxygen level and the return of the sine wave but at a greatly reduced level. So that's a good mimic for these clean water, dirty water systems that we find elsewhere in the world. Okay, our latest work past couple years is we are looking for signs that the system is about to undergo that sort of collapse. And unfortunately, oxygen is not a good one to use. By the time the oxygen level starts to drop, it's too late. So instead, what we are doing is using proteomic biomarkers. So working with a good molecular biologist in our department, we are actually doing whole ecosystem protein assays of what's in those leaves. Uh, because if we think of this ecosystem as a little factory, what it's churning out are proteins uh, based on the biological activity, especially of the microbes. And so we are hoping, at least initially, to find some of these protein indicators that might tell us if the system was in danger of collapsing. And so we do see these changes in the state that occur as we go from aerobic bacteria in the high oxygen system to anaerobic bacteria under the low oxygen conditions. Okay, now um, we have from our first field experiment, we have our unmanipulated controls and we have this group that are fed the wasp chow. And the different colors in these plots actually represent different microbe species. The reason is, if we have been able to identify the protein, there are existing libraries that allow us to map it back to the name of an organism, or at least the closest name. So we don't actually have E. coli in these enriched treatments, but the proteins that are produced are more similar to E. coli than to any of the other organisms that are in the library. So this allows us to rapidly assay not only what the proteins are being produced, but probably what kinds of microorganisms are producing them under these different treatments. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now about the work of my current PhD student, Amanda Northrup. She actually started as an undergrad working in our lab and after a few years going away to do some other work, decided she wanted to come back and continue her studies. So Amanda's been working on this problem called hysteresis. And this word really means a stubborn time lag, a stubborn time lag. And the model for hysteresis is dealing with two things. First, we need some kind of an environmental driver. So detritus could be such a driver. The level of nutrients in an aquatic system could be such a driver. And that's on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have our response variable. And in this particular study, it's the amount of uh, surface carophyte vegetation. So the way these experiments work is we start up here at the top, and we begin to enrich the system by increasing the phosphorus load. And as that happens, we start losing these characteristic aquatic plants. And the system collapses all the way down, and we have none of the plants left, but we have a lot of phosphorus in the environment. Now, we stop those additions. So we eliminate that addition of phosphorus, which is going to get processed and transformed by the organisms that are there. And the phosphorus levels start to decrease, so we move this way in the path. But notice that even though the phosphorus level is back down to something fairly low, we don't have those plants back anymore. We have to get to a very low level before the vegetation finally starts to recover. And this graph encapsulates what has happened over and over again as we try to deal with the restoration of polluted bodies of water. Again, in Lake Champlain, we have imposed restrictions on farmers to try and limit the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that makes its way down into the lake. But in spite of that, we still are getting these blue-green algae blooms. We cannot control them. And so it's this hysteresis, this stubborn time lag that we are concerned about. Um, and what seems to be happening is that there are other feedback loops going on in these two states that tend to keep it in the state. It's like a little basin of attraction, and we have to push the system rather far away to get beyond that basin of attraction. 
So there is some other element, and I'll suggest in a few minutes what that might be in this system. Hysteresis matters because, of course, we're worried about these sudden state changes that can take place in ecosystems. And, as I said, we want to figure out how to restore them and what we can do. So there's a lot of applied interest in this problem as well. Unfortunately, we have only a handful of good examples of hysteresis from lake systems because the time scale for this to occur is on the order of years to decades for these collapses to take place and even longer for the recovery. So the advantage of our little Saracenia microecosystem is we can cause the collapse to occur within about a day or two and we can get recovery within a couple weeks. And so that allows us to carry out experiments and do things that are much harder to do in these larger aquatic ecosystems. Okay, so it's really a fairly simple procedure that we need to do. First, we need to load the pitchers with organic matter, and that's easy. We can add detritus or wasps or whatever we want to. Uh, we need to measure that organic matter concentration twice a day for a good amount of time. We need to measure the dissolved oxygen. That's the response variable, whereas the detritus is the driver variable. And then we're just going to plot those two in a graph, just like I showed you before. Well, the problem was this step, measuring the organic matter concentration. We spent about six to nine unproductive months trying to figure out how to do this. Some of the things we tried were, well, we recognize that ants are nice little packets of nutrients, so we thought we could put individual ants in and then fish them out and weigh them to see how much was left, but that wasn't working very well. We even tried to make little tea bags with ants in them, and so we would let them brew inside the pitcher plants, but again, the measurements were not accurate enough for what we needed to do. I went to our molecular biologist and I said, look, can't you just do the pro same protein assay you were doing before and tell me how much material is left? He said, I can't do it. In that state, it's all particulate. I need basically all the water from the pitcher to do that, so we would have to stop the experiment. I said, there must be some molecular solution you can come up with. And he got this little twinkle in his eye and he said, let me get back to you on that. And so a couple days later, what he came back with was this bovine serum albumin, which is taken from cow's blood. It's very nutrient uh, and protein rich. And if we spice it up with some DNA and salts, we can get its chemical nutrient profile to look very similar to arthropod prey. But the key thing about bovine serum albumin is it's water soluble. So we only have to take out a few microliters to be able to estimate the concentration that is remaining. So that was the ticket that we needed. That solved our problem and got us past the six to nine months of getting no work done. Now, we did, needed to do a couple of initial experiments to make sure this was going to work. So our initial experiments show that if you load those pitchers up with bovine serum albumin, the oxygen level collapses just like it does with natural prey, and it also comes back up after a period of recovery if you don't add any more. We also established that this molecule is stable in aquatic solution. So it doesn't break down spontaneously on its own. It will only break down if it has been transformed and decomposed by microbes. So with those two caveats in mind, we were able to go ahead and set up our experiments. And so this is what they look like. On the x-axis here is the concentration of the bovine serum albumin. We start up here on the y-axis with dissolved oxygen. At the start of the experiment, the plants are well oxygenated. We begin adding more and more of the bovine serum albumin. The oxygen level collapses. We stop the addition, and then we start to see the return. And that's the classic hysteresis plot. It looks exactly the same as what we've seen from those other open water systems. But one of the things we can do in this nice controlled system is we can run different sorts of experiments. So our next set of experiments was to say, well, what if we change the delivery rate, how often and how much of this material we're adding? What happens to our curve? And what we discovered is we get very different answers depending on whether we have low, medium, or high delivery rates. 
The low delivery rate, if we just stop there, that's the classic hysteresis that we observe in many of these lake ecosystems. Uh, but the story is far more interesting than that. At an intermediate concentration, what happens is the system collapses, but when it comes back, it essentially retraces its steps. So this is really a kind of envir simple environmental tracking. There's no time lag here. As soon as we stop the addition of the BSA, we start to get the oxygen levels coming back up, and it shows that same profile. But then, most amazing, at the high concentration, we actually get this, what we're calling a reverse hysteresis, because it's going in the opposite direction. The system plunges very rapidly, and then on the return, actually jumps back up. Okay? So again, we reveal a much more interesting set of possibilities than we've seen from the handful of big lake experiments. The classic hysteresis represents only one possible outcome. And from the applied perspective, the lesson that comes from this experiment is the kinds of systems that may be most difficult to restore are those that have been exposed to chronic low levels of an environmental driver. Uh, those may be very difficult for us to restore. Other delivery rates, higher delivery rates, we will get a different trajectory, but without the classic hysteresis plot. So um, regardless, though, of the track that occurs, you can see that by the end of the experiment, we're back up pretty close to our starting oxygen level. So most aquatic biologists and managers would look at this and say, that recovery was a success because we have restored the oxygen level, which is what we wanted to do. But we've taken a look a little bit further, and what we've done is, again, using the proteomic assays, we look at the initial profile of the taxa that are there, and again, these are just the different groups of microbes that are represented, and then we look at it at the end of the experiment in the low and the intermediate and the high treatments. And what I want you to see from this is that although the oxygen level has come back to what it originally was, the microbes are different. We have a different suite, a different composition of microbes. And it is likely this change in the composition of the microbes that is responsible for those changes in the oxygen profile that we had seen before. Okay. Well, if you're a fan, as I certainly was growing up with it, of the classic Star Trek series, you certainly know about this device. It's a tricorder. Uh, Kirk and his crew went all around the galaxy pointing it at different things to see what its elemental composition is, what it was made of, and um, what other elements they could see. It's not unrealistic to imagine that one day for water quality control, we might have a kind of tricorder where we could take a water sample assay the proteins that are in it and be able to say, ah, this body of water is in danger of a eutrophic collapse if we keep going that way, whereas that body of water seems like it will be okay. And the work I presented you here is a first step towards being able to use these proteomic tools. They're still hard to use, but as the technology gets better, we'll be able to do these in a faster and simpler way. Okay, key results from the pitcher plant experiment to leave you with. First, I've argued that the pitcher plants are a model system for studying aquatic nutrient enrichment because we can quickly collapse it and monitor the recovery, and many aspects of it look just the way they do in other aquatic systems. And secondly, we see this classic pattern of community collapse and recovery with an environmental time lag. That's the hysteresis. And I've suggested that maybe in the future we can actually use this as a kind of bioassay, an early warning indicator for systems that may be in danger. Okay, well, we started with this graph of the increase in human population, and we've seen the cascading effects of global temperature increases for the ant system, and also the uh, release of nutrients into the environment and what that does for aquatic systems. I want to turn now briefly to the question of why do ecology or why am I doing ecology? The answer seems self-evident uh, from this, uh, which is, well, I'm interested in saving the planet and understanding these processes. And um, I have to confess to you, that's not why I do ecology at all. I never had an initial interest in any of these environmental problems. 
So I'm not doing it to save the world. Why am I doing it? Well, it's strictly for hedonistic, selfish reasons. As I tell my students, ecology is not the same as environmental science. Environmental science is solving the kinds of problems that I've talked about. But ecology is really about the basic interactions between organisms, how nature is put together. So my reasons for studying ecology, first, I really enjoy the natural history. I enjoy being outdoors, working with these organisms. Uh, to me, they are aesthetically beautiful, and that's important because much of the field work we do is, is tedious, repetitive, and sometimes has to be done under quite miserable conditions. So you have to have something about the system that you like. I like these organisms. I like being out in these bogs. I like getting away from people. And I've been able to do that by doing this kind of research. Uh, second is the reliance. I'm really interested in field studies and experiments. And in a way, that's counter to the whole environmental ethics and environmental philosophy, which is we leave no footprints. We just go out and observe nature. But I'm taking inspiration from the physicists and chemists who say if we want to learn how a system works, we have to push it. We have to change it. And we have to monitor responses. And so that's what we do with the various field experiments, some of which I've talked about here today. Um, statistics and data analysis is also something that I have become very interested in, in the past 10 or 20 years. The human brain can only hold about six or seven numbers at one time, but we generate thousands, tens of thousands of numbers through our research. So the statistics is a way to collapse or distill those numbers down to something that is simpler and more meaningful. And the process of using statistics is also critical for how we test hypotheses and draw conclusions in all of science. I'm also interested in the modeling. I make a distinction here between statistics, which is dealing with the numbers we collect from our observations, and modeling, where we will sometimes plug into simpler, more formal mathematical models. And the purpose of those is so we can make meaningful forecasts. We're only able to be out in the field for maybe 20 years, if we're lucky. Uh, our forecasts need to go much longer than that. So the mathematical tools kind of let us extend our vision and take those short-term results and ask what's going to happen in the long run. I told you I like to be alone and be outdoors, and many people who study ecology do. But science is a very collaborative activity. And um, the best science is the science that we do with other people. And I've had some great collaborators over the years. I will just point out, though, my uh, collaborator, Aaron Ellison, at the Harvard Forest, he and I have worked now for the past 25 years or more on bogs in New England, and that's been great. Uh, in addition to the science collaborations and the network of people that you build up for doing science with, it turns out, um, well, also my younger collaborators, my graduate students uh, who continue on this work, as I get older, it gets tougher to do the kinds of things I used to do, but um, they're kind of my avatar, so they can go out there and continue to do all this cool stuff. In addition to the science connections, it turns out many of these people are musicians, so I have a whole parallel network of people that I play music with, some of whom I don't get to see for years on end, but eventually we get back together again. And the music has been a special treat. Um, scientists make great musicians because we do experiments with our music the same way we do with our natural field systems. I want to turn now to a final question, which is one that's more for you, and that is why get a degree in the sciences at all? Um, the two reasons for not getting a degree, first are we're in kind of an economic boom time. And historically, students go to school less often when the economy is doing better. Second is, as you know better than anyone, the huge burden of student loans that you are likely to accumulate as you do this. So what's waiting for you at the end? Well, any guidance counselor or someone who tells you what job is going to be there, they don't know. We cannot say for sure what is going to be waiting for you at the end. But I'm going to make an argument that a science undergraduate degree is exactly what you need for any interesting job that you're going to get in the world, maybe not even in science or biology. Why is that so? Um, because you're going to end up with a skill set if you do a science degree. The first thing you're going to get is you're going to learn analytical reasoning. You're going to learn how to approach a problem, any problem, and think about it the way a scientist would. And that turns out to be extremely useful 
for getting to the um, heart of arguments and understanding causes and effects. My wife is a criminal defense attorney, so she always likes to practice her deliveries on me before she goes in front of a jury because she knows I'm willing to pick apart the evidence and, and things and arguments that she's making. And as I've joked with her, if she's really trying to get an acquittal, she really wants a whole jury of scientists because the standards for evidence that we use in sciences are actually quite high uh, compared to other areas. So you're going to learn those skills of analytic reasoning that apply in a lot of areas. Also, and this has been fairly recent, if you're in a good biology program, you're going to get exposed to some computational skills. That's been the biggest revolution in biology that's taken place in about the past 15 years. So at Vermont and lots of places, probably here also, we are incorporating more computer instruction in our biology curriculum because it's absolutely critical for being able to work with the numbers that we collect. It's sort of ironic. I teach this big required ecology evolution course at the University of Vermont. I've got now up to about 200 students. 95% of those students want to go on and be pre-med. So right away, most of my class doesn't really want to be there. I desperately want them to be there. I do not want a doctor prescribing antibiotics who does not understand basic principles of evolution. So I feel very motivated uh, to have them there. As I tell them, if I do a good job in this class, though, some of you are going to leave medicine by the end of the semester and decide that this kind of work is actually a whole lot more interesting. I also, though, at Vermont, which definitely uh, advertises itself as a very green university, I have students who are passionate about the environment and working in envir on environmental issues. And sadly, I lose some of those students, and the reason I lose them is they are not ready to deal with the math, the statistics, the heavy number crunching that really is a part of this discipline. And the computational skills um, are definitely a new tool. You're going to learn technical writing. Now, of course, as a college student, you're going to have a writing requirement anyways, but the kind of writing you do in an English or a poetry class is rather different. Uh, that kind of writing for literature the appeal of it is the ambiguity of words and the multifaceted meanings that we can attach to a phrase. That's what makes literature interesting. We hate that in the sciences. We don't want that at all. We want everything to be crystal clear, so we obsess on the exact wording that we use, how we describe things. We have a level of precision that's necessary so that someone who does not know you can read the methods that you used and repeat that work again. And that requires a level of precision and clarity in your thinking that does not occur in other forms of writing. Public speaking. You need to learn how to present your work, to present it not hidden behind a wall of jargon or incomprehensible terms, but so that people can understand it the first time through, that they can get the big picture, that they can know what you're doing. And finally, and I don't have to tell you this if you're a science major and you have roommates who are on other majors on your campus, it's a pretty demanding work schedule. Uh, the bio majors are front-loaded with a lot of courses in chemistry, physics, mathematics. You're going to be busy, and again, it's good training for what you're going to face in any interesting job that you get to out in the world. And also, I would say the ability to think on your feet. In sciences, part of what we do is ask critical questions. And you've got to be prepared to be able to answer those. So this is a great skill that you will get. Now, the actual job you're going to get when you finish all this, um, I don't know. But I would say any employer would want these skills for their employee. If you're running a business, you're managing something, you want someone that can do exactly these things. So I would say with your science degree, you will be able to go on and get almost any job that you want. And so um, I will tell you about two, quickly, two alternative career paths of former students and people that I have known. Most people who go on to get their PhD in biology, they would like to get a professor job. Well, those things are disappearing for a number of reasons. And so my job right now, I feel kind of like a whale harpooner in the year 1880. There's a couple more decades, and the job I do, at least in the form that it's in, is not going to exist.
But there are other jobs out there. So one of my recent PhD students who really got into programming, he is now a senior data analyst at Apple Computer. Now he's a good programmer, but of course good programmers are a dime a dozen at Apple. The reason they hired him is he is a good programmer who knows how biological systems work. And so they want his expertise, his perspective as a biologist to solve some of their challenging computer programs. Uh, I'll mention one other career path that uh, came out. About 10 years ago, I played music, because I play music every year at these big annual meetings and organize musicians, and met a PhD student, Jenny Levine, who was studying disease, human disease dynamics at Penn State. She also happened to be a fabulous jazz clarinet player, so we had a great swing band the year that she was there. But a few years went by, she decided she didn't want to go into the academic rat race, it was too competitive, so instead she moved to New Orleans where she's now a professional jazz clarinet player. I think that's ironic because the only thing harder than getting a job in academics is getting paid to play music. Um, so that's where she was, but she also has a second job. She works as kind of a general business manager for a local synagogue. And she told me that the church members at her synagogue love her ability to troubleshoot problems, to analyze and reason through all the things they have to deal with of resource shortages and time conflicts and all that. And they really recognize her science background allows her to do that. So that's my pitch to you. Whatever it is you're going to go on to do, I think the science background is going to serve you very well uh, when you get done. OK, so um, I started with this big problem of human population growth. We looked at a few things that ants do in response to the increasing temperatures on the globe. And then we turned to water pollution and saw how this system of carnivorous plants can be used to study the problem of eutrophication and collapse. I thank you for listening. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Hi, I'm Caitlin O'Neill. Um, I was wondering the like, ant boxes. So you said that like, they were a lot of money, so you were only able to like you were able to do the same temperature and like sweat two of them. So I was wondering if there are any uh, like if there are any benefits to it besides saving money, like what were the setbacks? Oh, well, there actually is a great benefit to this kind of design. The typical way people would do this design is they would say, well, we'll pick three or four temperatures and we'll do multiple chambers of each of those. And that gives you a very precise estimate for what's going on at that temperature. But for modeling climate change, what we actually want is a smooth function. So for the purposes of building models, it actually is better to have the separate chambers to have a, a much wider array of individual temperatures than to have too much concentrated on a single one. So that's so it, it's it's useful for that as well. Here? Hi, Melissa. Um, I'm interested to know until we can get the start track um, what you use to um, calculate the um, waters. Is it similar to what they test in fish aquariums? Um, uh, it is similar to that, but I mean we have to this has to go through a starch gel, the equivalent of an electrophoresis. The bands have to be cut out. They have to go through a mass spec to be broken down into proteins. So as I said, right now, it's still a fairly labor-intensive operation. And it's also very hard because the existing proteomic work has all come from the medical world. So they're used to working with like just a particular tissue type and handling a small number of known proteins. Whereas I'm handing our molecular biologists this bag of goo, there are all these proteins. Many of them have never been characterized before. It's a much harder task. But I, I do think in the long run, this sort of thing is realistic and could be done. Right, questions here? Uh, hi, I'm Xavier Schober. Um, while we're talking about water pollution, I just had a thought um, with hemp becoming a new thing and them growing it, do we know if that's uh, fertilizer use for those are going to affect the water quality any worse? Or uh, good question. We don't know, but I mean the problem is any sort of nutrient that you add to an aquatic system, if plants are not able to directly use it, many microbes will as well. So we probably are going to see some changes with those. Yeah. Here. What do you use to, uh, to heat? I'm sorry, I'm Alex. Uh, what do you use to heat the uh, the ant chambers? Oh, so we've got a hot water heater that passes over. Um, 
we, we heat, the, the air is blown by a fan over this hot water heater and then through those circulating tubes. Well, what heats the hot water heater? Oh, we've got, uh, we've got in, um, a gas engine, it's propane. Um, and one of the ironies, I didn't get the numbers out, but we have a huge carbon footprint from having run this experiment, huge. Because we did it for five years, we kept those things going. Here. My name's Kelsey. Um, when you were doing the ant experiment, how did you identify some of the indirect effects between the species? So that's where we start getting into the nuts and bolts of the statistics. But basically in the statistics, we take two alternative models, one which only has the direct effects and the other that has the indirect effects. And then we say, is there a difference in how well these models fit the data? And we go by the principle of parsimony. We take the simplest model possible, but in many cases that simpler model actually did include those other links. So again, this is what I was saying about doing more statistics and math. That's the kind of tools that we need for doing that. Other questions? Here. Um, when you're talking about um, hysteresis and the uh, points, so there are timelines and consistent recovery. Are there any differences in figuring out how to stop those timelines or speed up the recovery? Not yet, but the key is that when we have a hysteretic system like that, it means that there is a third player, something else is happening. So the graphs we show just have the environmental driver and the response variable. But there must be a feedback loop with a third element that's keeping it in that. And I've argued here in this case that that feedback element may be the change in the microbe composition. That it, because when we got to the end of the experiment, the microbes were no longer the same. Um, so we do have to find that additional piece in these hysteresis experiments. There's something else that's causing, uh, we call them basins of attraction. So it tends to stay in the clear water system and it can be pushed around a little bit. But if we push it too far, it goes to this new system and then it's somewhat stuck in that place as well. Other questions? Okay, thanks for listening.